How's everybody doing? You doing pretty good? All right, well, my name is uh, LaFoster Williams. My brother and I have a company called Raising the Level, which means raising the level of consciousness and raising the level of awareness. And today my topic is on diversity. That's my subject. And the title of my presentation is Diversity, the Problems with Diversity, and the Solutions for Diversity. So I'm going to talk about some facts, and then I'm going to talk about some solutions. Um, but first, I'd like to start with um, where our name came from. Excuse me. So um, I once read a book called Revolutionary Suicide. It was by uh, Huey P. Newton, who was the founder of the Black Panther Party. They were an, or, uh, an organization back in the 1960s for the uplifting of black people. They talked about economic inclusion, um, so we can have uh, money, social inclusion, and they also had like a self-defense program. But he wrote, he wrote the book Revolutionary Suicide, and when I was reading the book, the words raising the level jumped out to me, because he said the only way to help the black community is by raising their level of consciousness so they can build their own institutions, schools, hospitals, and we can all contribute to America. Um, and so that's where our, the name of our company came from. And then I thought about it, I was like, hmm, that's a great name for a company because we're trying to raise a level of consciousness for everybody, not just black people, but white people. Because a lot of us went to public schools and private schools, but they never taught us about the black culture, our contributions to American history and the things that we provided for America. So my task and my brother's task, we're trying to uplift our culture and elevate ourselves so we can all have the same economic inclusion, have the same opportunities and things like that. Um, so like I said, my subject today is on diversity. And me personally, I think the term diversity is way, way too broad. And it needs to be narrow in its uh, scope so we can help more people. And my definition, uh, when I researched and I did my studies, is basically if you're not a white male, then you're considered diverse. So if you're a veteran, disabled, a woman, uh, black woman, white woman, any culture that you are, you're considered diverse. So that means that umbrella is humongous. Um, and it's hard to help each individual group because everybody fits under that one umbrella. So my task as a black man is to talk about diversity in terms of black people. And then I feel like people who are representing other communities and other groups should come in and talk about their group. And then we can all you know, learn from each other rather than one person talking about everybody. Like I didn't serve in the military, so I don't know about veterans. Um, I'm not disabled, so I don't know about those experiences, but I do know the experiences of being a black man in America. Um, so that's the reason why I'm here today to talk about it. Um, and then, and I also studied somebody named Marcus Garvey. Uh, he created the organization back in 1921. It was called the UNIA, which is the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And he said a quote that, uh, let me see here, no chain is stronger than its weakest link. And in my opinion right now, in America, based on social, industrial, and political power, I feel like black people are the weakest link in that chain. And if you look at every ethnic group on that chain, the chain, if the chain breaks, then we are going to break and going to lose together. So when we, when we rise, everybody else rises. So I think that we need to uplift the people at the lowest of the totem pole and so we can rise up. Um, so I'm going to get into my presentation. So basically, so last Friday, um, I was at Pasini's with my girlfriend and I was waiting to be seated and it was a Time Magazine sitting there. I like to read a lot. So I picked up the Time Magazine, uh, going through articles and I came across an article uh, titled, Diversity Has Become a Booming Business, So What Are the Results? And the article was written by Pamela Newkirk. It was dated October 10th, 2019. So the facts and statistics that I got from this article came out last month. And she's the author of a book called Diversity Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business. And then so some of these statistics I have them listed. I'll give it to you guys afterwards. So I'm going to go through some statistics that I found. And the statistics are based on black people, black men, black women, and management and companies. So the first statistic, in 2003, MIT professor Thomas Koken noted that companies were spending an estimated $8 billion a year on diversity efforts. And that's in 2003. Um, so the industry has exploded since then. In 2019, a survey came out. Uh, of 234 companies in the S&P 500 found that 63% of diversity professionals has been appointed to the roles in the past three years. Um, in March 2018, the job site indeed reported that postings for diversity and inclusion professionals has risen 35% in the past two years. However, people of color make up 40% of the U.S. population, but we still remain underrepresented in most influential fields. So I'm going to give some uh, statistics. From 1985, that's the year I was born, to 2016, the proportion of black men and management at U.S. companies with 100 or more employees went from 3% to 3.2%. So that increase of 0.2% is absolutely nothing. Like, that's, that, to me, that's zero. That's 31 years, and we went 0.2%. 
Um, from 2009 to 2018, the percentage of black law partners went from 1.7% to 1.8%. So we spend all this money on diversity, but it's barely inching and budging. Um, and another survey, people of color held about 16% of Fortune 500 board seats in 2018. Um, another survey for 2018, 15 of the largest public and fashion apparel companies found that non-whites held only 11% of board seats and nearly two thirds of the company CEOs were white males. Uh, in 2017, the top 200 film releases, minorities accounted for 7.8% of writers and 12.6% of directors and they had 19.8% of lead roles. So people see movies like Black Panther and we feel like, they feel like black people are taking over cinema. But if you do the research and look at the facts, we're not taking over cinema. We just we look powerful on the screen because there's so many of us. But if you look at all the films, 200 films, like I said, I can't believe that only 7.8% are writers. Um, and then in fall 2017, 81% of full-time uh, professors at degree granting post-secondary schools were white 3% were Hispanic and 4% were black. So that shows you these diversity efforts aren't not really doing anything. It's mostly like symbolic to me. Um, they're putting black people in places as symbolism, but we need them to be able to make decisions. Uh, let's see here. And another statistic, this will probably be my last statistic. In 2014, Google reportedly spent 114 million, that's 114 million on, this, on diversity efforts but it showed that blacks make up only 3.3% of the workforce at Google. They've only held 2.1% of tech jobs and only 2.6% of leadership roles. So, they, so I don't know where the money went. So they, you know what I mean? They spent $114 million. I'm like, so where is it going? No one knows. But I think it's just all symbolic, and they're not really doing it uh, to actually change America. They're doing it to save face with the public, for investors, and things of that nature. So those are some statistics. There are more statistics out there, but those are the ones that jumped out to me when I was sitting at dinner with my girlfriend. I was like, look at this, look at this. Like, look at these statistics. And she couldn't believe it. And my girlfriend is a white woman, and she's a, a teacher. And so we talk about diversity all the time. I, I, I give her advice on how to like, help the black kids in her classroom and things like that. So when I show her these, these statistics and articles, like, she was like flabbergasted. Like, she could not believe it. And I was like, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure where the money is going. But we need to make a change. So I do have a, um, like three or four solutions that I want to talk about that I found via my research. Um, so basically, the, num the number one solution, companies need to analyze metrics related to hiring, pay, promotions, and bonuses related to gender and uh, racial lines. And we need to figure out and how to disrupt the patterns of biasness because a lot of companies are just putting people in, in positions, but it's not really doing anything. Um, another solution is uh, we need less unconscious bias training and more interventions. Like for example, the NFL created a rule where it requires a diverse slate of candidates for coaching jobs and, and, and front office jobs. So they're not creating a diversity position. They're just saying we have a position, but we're gonna try to fill it with somebody of color or a black person or a woman and stuff like that. So I think that we're doing too much. And also I work for Multnomah County Library, you know what I'm saying? I'm a black cultural library advocate. I'm a librarian from Multnomah County. And I got hired because they're doing diversity, but I'm like, I should have got hired just because you, are, you guys are hiring, not because you have a diversity position on the internet and I applied for it and y'all hired me because you know I'm articulate and I know what's going on. But my friends can't get hired because there's no more diversity positions open, but there's a number of positions opening. Um, so that's another one. <laughs> uh, the third solution, like I said, we need to start creating symbolic diversity positions and place black people, especially black men, in positions of authority at companies. For example, like in the film industry, we need black executives who can green light projects and not just like Denzel Washington and Will Smith acting in the project. So we need people who can be like, all right, this is going to be good for the black community or this is going to be good for that community or this community. So if you look at, uh, the, you look, look at the executives and movie industries, most of them aren't black unless you think about Tyler Perry who opened his own facility out in Atlanta and he's like greenlighting green light, green his own projects, hiring black people, making movies for everybody and things of that nature. And Hollywood is also contracting with his facility so they can uh, you know, do projects there like uh, Marvel uh, movies and things like that. Uh, let's see what else. And then the last solution, we need courageous leadership. We need people to check their own biases and think about, hmm, why is this still happening if I'm in a position of power and I can make a change? Um, so we need leaders and managers to change their behavior and their practices and change their, also their incentive structure 
Um, and just basically interrogate their own behavior and figure out like, why is this happening? What can I do, especially as a white male with some power, what can I do to put people in power? Not just like, oh, let's create a diversity position. Like, how about we don't create no more diversity positions and we take the positions that we have and put people in those positions? Um, like, you know, like my example at the library, like I wouldn't have got in in 2014 if it didn't say we're looking for a black, this, 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 and that. So I do black story time, I do black programming, I get black presenters to come in. So I do a great job for the library. But now for like a token, they got me on all the billboards, all the leaflets, and I'm like, okay, it's cool, but I'm like the only black person there now. And since I've been there, I got like four or five black people hired, but it was all through diversity. I'm looking at the managers like, let's just hire people based on their, uh, you know, their qualifications. You know, let's interview candidates who are qualified, not because they're black, not because they're white, not because they're whatever, but whoever can do the job the best, that person should get the job. Um, so in closing, we need courageous leadership and true progress won't come without discomfort. So we need people to be uncomfortable. And as a black man, I'm uncomfortable all the time because you know I live in Portland. <laughs> and when I walk around, even coming in this building, I, I feel kind of uncomfortable. I'm like, are they thinking why am I here? Or, or am I accepted to be here? And that's how I felt literally walking in today. But I feel comfortable enough because I'm confident to do what I have to do. But some black people don't feel that way. Some black people are intimidated because you know their own you know internal feelings. And one more thing right now, um, there's a black billionaire named Byron Allen. And he's uh, going against Comcast right now because Comcast is spending 14 billion with a B on licensing uh, content and also they're licensing uh, cable networks. But they're only spending five to six million on black content. So there's 14 billion being spent in a year, five million for black people and people of color. So that tells you right there that we're not getting any economic inclusion. And if we don't have economic inclusion, we're gonna suffer, we're gonna lose because we're not being taught this in school, we're not being taught this at home and we're not being tied this at work. So now, economically, we're at the bottom. And like I said, I saw it to my girlfriend, she's like, well, the test scores for brown kids, Hispanic kids, and da-da-da is all the same. But I was like, but the, their life at home isn't the same. So imagine, because I grew up with white friends, I'm in Portland, imagine like I didn't eat dinner, and I go to school the next day, I'm hungry so I can't focus, but my white friend went out to dinner with his parents, they went to Olive Garden, and he's at school, we're in the same class, his grades are better, he's more focused, and I'm not and his test scores are better, my test scores are lower, and it all contributes to my life at home as well. So people are forgetting that when you go to school or you go to work, we're suffering from you know, our disadvantages, and so that's why it's hard for us to compete. And when I say compete, we're not trying to take no one out of their position, we're trying to rise up the ladder and be on top as well. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you guys have any questions or if you want to have a dialogue or a conversation. Yeah, I have a question. So yeah. uh, most of the folks here are entrepreneurs. And this mm -hmm. is a great conversation about how we as entrepreneurs could diversify our staff. Uh -huh. How do you suggest most of them do that? Because as you already noted, like in the Pearl District, it's a very white-centric neighborhood. Yeah. How, how do we get into those communities to figure out how to interface better with those communities? I think the number one thing that's happening is fear. People have to check their own fear and not be afraid to like, if you have like a job fear, you have to be confident enough to probably go out to Southeast Portland where a lot of black people are and know the job fair out there and not be scared to do it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Go to communities where people are rather than having them come to your community. Because like me, like it's hard for me. I, I'll go to Pro District, I'm comfortable, I'm fine. But I know some of my friends won't go to Pro District because they feel like as a black man they can't go there. So I think that you people should go outside of their comfort zone, go to communities where the people are living, set up a table and have an informational session and don't be scared. Like it's, people are scared. Like I, I have a white homeboy, he told me when he was 15 years old, because we talk real and frank to each other, he's like, I was, there's these two black kids dribbling the basketball, going to the park, I'm coming from the park, and he said, I looked at them and I had like some type of fear like they were gonna do something to me, but they just dribbling the basketball, so he checked himself, and that's what it means, just check your own biases, and don't be scared to get out of your comfort zone and go to where the people are. So that's pretty much how to do it. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, number two is there's not a lot of minorities in uh -huh. uh, I actively look for developers to go to these events. Uh -huh. So I'm not going to do this job search here, but I'm intrigued on getting more events, job fairs, internship fairs on, on that side of town because, to be honest, the best developer that we have in our company that I contract with is an African American. Okay. And I found him through Twitter through a friend. 
any of the things that we're being told. You want to go recruit, go to you know, this tech event, or go to this thing, right? Um, so I'm intrigued kind of on that opportunity of how do we, as you know, especially as entrepreneurs, our first hires probably turn into VPs, turn into co-founders. How do we interface on that side to make sure that it's, it's not a room for the way to be? I think what we have to do also is just when you guys have staff meetings or board meetings, tell them that we want to take our services and our events outside of where we normally have them at and go to places that never had them before and be able to travel. Maybe you can get reimbursement for gas or whatever, but we have to change the whole entire model, flip it upside down, and rather than having them come to you, you go to them. Like literally get in your car and go talk to people. Like my brother and I used to go like do surveys at the max. What are you interested in? What do you want to do? How, what is this? Like sometimes you got to go put the, the, the work in by actually marching out there with a clipboard and go talk to people. Say, hey, I'm a tech guy out of this company. You know, well, what do you do for a living? Oh, I do this and that. Or, have you been interested in doing tech or development or web design? Oh, no, I never thought about that. Well, here's my business card. Check it out. So I think it might start with like face to face, one person at a time. Like, you know, like you said, you may smile on Twitter. That's the best way to do it. Or if you know someone who knows somebody, and then you be like, hey, uh, we're hiring. Can you send anybody that you know my information? I can put them through the process, interview them, and see if they qualify. Or if they don't qualify, I can, I can teach them how to qualify. I can teach them what classes they need to take, what books they need to read, who they need to talk to. Because sometimes people don't know what to do, but they want to do it. But they need someone like you who's, who's you know, confident enough to be like, hey, just talk to me. Come have a meeting with me, you know, coffee or whatever, and I'll explain to you how to get into this industry. And it might take one person at a time. Yeah. Also, there's fear on both sides. We're, we're in fear, and you guys are in fear. And we have to bridge our relationship. Like, I believe in, this might sound corny, but I believe in love. Like, the way to save, to save humanity is loving each other and just, you know, getting to know each other. We're all human beings. Like, we're all human beings. We're not some animals, some humans. Like, we're all human beings. And the best way to do it, like, Jefferson right there has a ton of black kids who are playing basketball, doing arts, and stuff like that. But they are interested in tech and coding, but they don't know that they can do it because they think only white people can do it. Because if you, if you look, I mean, even Google, like, they only got 2% of the workforce is black, but they're spending 114 million on diversity. So who are they hiring? Like, where's the money going? On billboards of black people in front, but nobody black is inside the building? So that's what I'm seeing. Because I work, like I said, I work for the county, and I'm on a billboard, but then if you go inside the building, there's 600 white employees and, and 30 black employees. So it's like, it's like kind of like a facade. Yeah. Do you know do you have that kind of information? Because this, what you just said proves that we don't understand the way, uh, the right way of bringing in a diverse workforce. Right? Uh -huh. We need someone like you to tell us, hey, listen, you know, we feel uncomfortable, you know, to come to an event uh, that is on this side. You know, we, there is a, a better way to involve. Uh, there is a better <laughs> way to. Uh, Attract a diverse uh, group of people to come to these events. Exactly. So, as as a business owner, as a, the, the owner of my company, the first thing I would do is hire someone like you, uh, a, a diverse person, to tell me uh, this is how you do it. You know, because I don't see the way you see it. Exactly. But, but you were saying that these big companies spend so much money in diversity. So does it mean? Does that mean that 
they don't have a person like you to advise them on what is the right way of creating that diverse workforce? Yeah, I can answer that. So basically what they're doing is hiring people who, who studied it but who didn't live the experience. I have a lived experience of being discriminated against, of, of feeling racism, of not being comfortable. But then they hire someone who has a degree, who went to school to learn about it, who can give you uh, facts and statistics, but they never lived it. So rather than hire me, they'll hire some white woman from Seattle to come down and do a training on unconscious biasness. But she never went through the experience. But she's smart and intelligent and knows about it. But I live it every single day. So I can tell you from my perspective as a black person why we're not coming. Like, I didn't, I, I walked up here, I was like, oh, take a deep breath. Like, oh my God. Like, even when I walked in the lobby, and even when I seen you, I was like, oh, there's another black person here. <laughs> like, that's how we really feel. When I seen you, I was like, oh, there's a black man in here. So we need to be comfortable. And we just need somebody that actually had the live experience and that can articulate and explain it. And not just someone who actually just studied it and then feels sympathy and empathy for it, but never went through it. It's interesting you say, uh, as a black person, you, you experience it like, oh, thank God, there's another black. I, I would imagine it's the same for women, right? Like, we yeah, yeah. The same exact thing. Yeah. Like, and, and I think what I struggle with, especially as a person that's trying to fill this space with a diverse group of founders, uh, recognizing that it's in the Pearl District, like mm -hmm. trying to find ways to make it, like literally we keep the door open. Yeah. And literally I, we have PDX Wit open up, Alpha Flowers. Um, Stephen Green from the he's very well represented of the entrepreneurial ecosystem for, for black founders. Uh -huh. um, and I totally get like trying to find ways to put thing, more things where the community is. Yeah. Beyond that, like what else can we be doing? And I also run the startup week, right? So okay. we're gonna have a whole week of events. Okay. What else can we be doing to access that community to say, sure, things may be on the West, but let's figure out how to get you over here. Let's figure out how to make that barrier uh, less, like let's figure out how to make that friction less. Well, maybe uh, offering some type of, because a lot of black people, I can't speak, I'm speaking to people I know don't have money to travel, so maybe say if you come here, we'll give you um, a bus pass. Yeah. Or maybe we can get a shuttle van and we can come pick you guys up. Even if you put pay out your own pocket, you got some extra money and bring people there. Because if people, if people don't have money or they just only have enough to pay their rent and their childcare, and they're struggling, they can't go out there. But if they was like, hey, this van is gonna be at this building at 12 p.m., we'll bring you back by four, provide free lunch, then they'll come. You know, sometimes you gotta come out your pocket if you want diversity to happen. You gotta, you gotta provide transportation for people to get there. Like I said, it's simple enough, or you can try to talk to try and say, hey, I have this event, can I partner with you guys? Maybe you guys can donate a couple bus passes and get people out there. Yeah. And uh, then provide free lunch. So that's how you do it. Like, if you don't have, the, if people don't have money or transportation, they're not gonna come. So it's easier to go to their community because that's where they live, but if they have to go outside of their community, they'll feel better if I was like, if they was like, oh, when I get there, I'm gonna be reimbursed for my gas, or reimbursed for however I got there, then I can, you know, I can come. So. Yeah, we try to do that by just making the event free, but I see what you're saying. Like, yeah. you can't even get on the bus. Thank you. Yeah. And some people don't have 225 to pay, to pay the bus because they, you know, had to pay for their kids, whatever. And it's like, I'm strapped for money. I got to borrow money. I got to go to a check cashing place to get some money out. And I don't want to do it, so I'm not going. But someone was like, all right, if you can pay, there's a $10 voucher for you when you get here. Or there's a $10 visa card you can reimburse yourself, then they'll come. And it has to be in the time of the day that it's uh, convenient. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people work Monday through Friday. So maybe on a Saturday or a Sunday, not like 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock on a Wednesday, and they're working. Yeah. So they can't come. But go ahead. Okay. Super privileged. I've been in Vancouver. I've been in Portland. Okay. And there's not like a six month period that they find that somebody doesn't mention a racial slur either to me or within my proximity. So just for people that might not understand the context, yeah. you're saying that it's a very real perceived or unperceived, it still affects you type of thing. Uh, just in case nobody knows, I think that's a legitimate concern. So I think that's dope. Yeah. Um, but the second question I had is actually for myself hiring. Like I didn't think about sort of my unconscious biases when hiring? Do you have like something from like a strategy perspective of when we're screening people, how to even see our own, how do we bring up those unconscious biases? Because I was thinking about that, I'm like, yeah, I look at somebody's picture, before yeah. I, you know, or I look, I look at their uh, you know, social media picture or something before I choose them or their name. 
do you know how like do you have a system to remove I mean it, the system is like I say you have to look deep in yourself and understand why you're feeling that way like why am I looking at this picture and discriminating against this person is it the media portrayal of these people is it something I read is it something my family said you have to check your own self like people are scared to check themselves and understand why like even me I was programmed to fear black men and I'm a black man you know what I'm saying? Because of the media image of us, they're gangsters, they're thugs, they're, they're, they're whatever, women abusers, whatever. But that's not true. I've never done none of that. I'm a professional. I'm a librarian. I'm a business owner. I'm a father. I have a girlfriend. We're going to be married. So but if, you look at, if you look at me, you might not think that. If I just walk down the street, you might not think that. So you have to understand, like, the best thing to do is look at people in a positive perspective first until they prove otherwise. And a lot of people don't do that. They just, the media said they're thugs, so they're thugs. Or the media thinks that this person might not be able to do the same job as a white person because historically they're more uh, incarcerated or whatever. But we're incarcerated because of the system, because of uh, we don't have economic inclusion. We don't have access to capital. <laughs> so you have to feed your family. If, if his daughter needs milk, he can go buy it. And some people's daughter don't need milk, they might have to go steal it. Now they're a criminal. Now they have a felony or a misdemeanor. And then when they try to get a job, we don't hire felons or criminals. But you don't understand he's trying to get milk for his daughter. So it's those type of things. We have to just check our internal biases and be uh, courageous enough to be like, you know what? There are a lot of white applicants. They have, you know, a PhD, da da da, associates, masters. But this person has a little bit of work experience. Let me give that person an opportunity. So just before I, you know, trying to, before I even go to press that like outreach to say that this person is out the next round, just thinking through what what do I got that might possibly affect this? Yeah. Maybe even like jotting that down. Yeah, yeah, think through it, man. And then also, I feel like the best thing to do, too, is also is read books published by, by, by black authors. Like I said, I read Revolutionary Suicide. If you read that book by Huey P. Newton, because a lot of people look at the Black Panther Party because America put them out there like they were thugs. They only wanted to carry arms, but they didn't. They created the, breakfast, the free breakfast club program that all American kids have. Free lunch at school was created by the Black Panther Party. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, so if you read these books, by black authors, like don't read books white people writing about black people, read black people writing about black people. And then we read those books on your leisure time, you start understanding how we think, where we come from, and then when it's time to do some hiring, those thoughts and those, that information, those statements will start spinning around in your brain, you're like, okay, okay, I see what's going on. So we have to read different literature, read different books, take different classes, and things of that nature. Go ahead. That's a, that's a great that's a great idea. There's some good local organizations. Ty comes to mind. They do a young entrepreneurs program, uh, and um, Foster High School. I think it's Foster Douglas High School on the east side. But there's a few, uh, especially on entrepreneurs, side, and I've volunteered and entered at those programs as well. Could really. So I think we can all think of a couple of like busy work style, low skill tasks that yeah. if we could offload from our own workload would allow us to do better things. I like that. Give that opportunity. One, one thing you said, that's, that's, that's a great idea, thank you. One thing you said that I really like, and um, like this is a really great conversation, because um, somebody was asking about the, you know, the decisions they make when they're making hiring decisions. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the work we're talking about is creating a more diverse organization, right? We're all kind of starting our companies. And one of the things that's super important is to ensure that there's an inclusive environment when you get those people there. Because yeah. one of the things that happens that keeps those companies from growing their diverse population is they actually are hiring, they don't stay. Thank you. Okay, and so I think that there are, the, 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 when we talk about unconscious bias, the problem with actually trying to find your own unconscious biases, because they're unconscious. Thank you. You don't know them. 
So, and we all have them. So there are great tools out there. I, I mean, if you want to just start some really simple places, just Google IAT, Implicit Associations Test. But it'll start giving you some questions you could ask when you're making a hiring decision, when you're making a promotion decision, just to make sure that you are not actually have a bias going into it. You're not hiring somebody that looks like you went to the same school as you, in the same golf club as you, drinks the same beer as you. Right. So yeah. I, I, wanted, I didn't want to make sure I threw that in. No, thank you. I didn't know about that, so I'm going to write that down yeah. for my next presentation. Um, like you mentioned, like now that you're an employee of the library, they have license to use your face everywhere. Yeah. That must suck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought it was cool at first. I'm like, yeah, I'm everywhere. And I realized, I'm like, wait, I'm like, a, they're like using me because they're not hiring no one, no one else, especially people who aren't like as studied as me or educated as me or as articulate as me. But these people can be just the same way if they have the opportunity and you give them time. And everything I'm talking about is not going to happen overnight. Like what you're talking about, it might take years, you know what I mean? But we have to try every single day and stop and think about it like why am I making this decision so you know that's how you go from unconscious to conscious when you stop and to think about it rather just flowing through and so that's how I look at it um, and my brother is going to hand out like um, our business cards and one of our brochures as well so if anyone wants to have a conversation or hire us for a diversity training whatever you guys want to do we're here um, I appreciate your time and everyone is great and thank you for listening everyone is paying attention and I feel great about this and thank you personally for letting us come here. Um, and, and thank everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, go ahead. One more question. Yeah. Obviously, more of this is out in Portland. We all are in the startup ecosystem. We all have Twitters and Instagrams sharing what's the best way to share getting new out Like, obviously, all of this has been filmed. Um, I think the best way is probably just talk to my brother. He's our administrator. Um, I'm not really that good at that type of stuff. I just prepare presentations and I just try to be passionate when I speak so I can like penetrate people's essence. Um, but my brother, you can talk to my brother. Uh, you talk to my brother, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah.